Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. Recyclico's patented recycling process achieves up to 100% recovery of battery metals from lithium ion batteries for electric vehicles, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, and aluminum. Recyclico Battery Materials Incorporated trades on the TSX Venture AMY, on the OTCQB AMYZF, and Frankfurt ID4. For more information, visit Recyclicode.com or phone us at 778-574-4444. Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Danielle Park, editor of the popular blog Juggling Dynamite and president of Venable Park Investment Council Incorporated. Her website's jugglingdynamite.com and venablepark.com. Welcome back to the show. Thank you, Jim. Did Easy Money set up a potential big bust? Yeah, that's for sure. Um, And it's coming out in spades now in all the data. So, you know, again, we've talked about it before, but we had that period of uh, very suppressed interest rates. And in the last um, couple of years, things have normalized. And now we have the highest real rates, that is the banking rates that are being charged and the central bank rates minus the, the rate of inflation is above 2%. We haven't had that for a number of years, and it is putting its brakes on the banking system credit that's flowing, and it's evident across the across the board. So, you know, the 80% of U.S. GDP is driven by the services sector, that's true, but the actual momentum in the economy is driven by primarily these very cyclical sectors, which are things like durable goods spending, residential real estate, and then business equipment and transportation, that sort of thing. So changes in those cyclical items are where the changes ultimately impact the economy the most because there's a baseline of spending and consumption that's going to be consistent throughout whether people, you know, their their subsistence level items they need, whether you're in a boom or a bust in the in terms of economic growth, people are going to be spending a certain amount. So it's those incremental portions, and 45% of um, the GDP is driven by discretionary spending. So that's the part that we're really seeing impacted right now, and it's showing up across the board in um, the job market, which where joblessness has been rising. Um, initial jobless claims today in the U.S. Uh, were higher by um, 232,000 for the August 17 week. Um, Canadian jobs were negative in July. Uh, They were expected to have a positive gain of 25,000. They ended up losing 2,800. So we've seen this bump up in the unemployment rate of 6.0 to 6.4% in uh, Canada and 4.3 in the U.S. This is the highest we've seen in several years. And um, so there's a whole bunch of warning signs going off that we're in a cyclical downturn and that we are in recession. One of the things that really stands out there, again, was you had this boom during the low-rate era that was um, accentuated by the pandemic and the crunch on um, the amount of people available for work. And so that, you know, made uh, employers have a harder time getting workers and then hold workers longer. So that's actually weighed heavily as we've gone into this downturn led by higher real rates, um, which takes some time to process through the economy. You're starting to see that they, they were reluctant to lay people off, but we've already had, for example, in the U.S., over 80,000 job cuts in August so far. And um, the uh, you're seeing the same thing actually in most countries. China's also had a tick up in its unemployment rate. And it's all led pretty much by the same factors that I referenced. The durable goods spending piece is really negative across the board in most countries. Residential real estate is in a multi-year downturn in China. There's been no sign of a bounce there. It was down another 0.65% month over month in the latest data for China. You got contracting bank credit in China for the first time in nearly 20 years. Um, households are really hurt by falling home prices, and that's because that's one of the few assets that people typically, you know, the majority of people typically buy. And so when the 
when the prices were goosed by free money and frenzy during the pandemic and now they're coming off, that's where people really feel that hard in terms of their balance sheet. But also, as I say, the pickup in unemployment is, is a real problem. So, you know, the other thing is that real rates are impacting not just housing, um, but on the durable goods spending side, you know, that includes things like furniture and appliances and all the things people typically buy for their house, but also things like automobiles. So average new car prices, you know, again, when rates were really low and everyone was in a frenzy, um, they increased more than 30% over five years. But now the average new car price is about 44000 and that's way beyond the ability of the of the mass to buy. So prices have been deflating in the past six months. Um, not only that, but the amount of miles driven has been falling. It was off negative 0.4% in June year over year. The number of um, people with licenses uh, has come down because it's just impossible to own a car. So it's remarkable. Things like uh, people up to age 24, there's less under 24-year-olds with licenses today than there were 40 years ago. Um, And it's, again, a function of auto insurance premiums jumped 50% in the last five years. Maintenance repairs jumped 37%. Gas prices went up 25%. So, again, that was all aided and abetted by, you know, handouts and and, um, uh, money that was free-flowing and then next to zero interest rates. But the problem is it's the price that has gone up so much now that's made it buying conditions actually the lowest that we've seen of any of the past six recessions. So, you know, that's, again, something we're seeing across the board. That's why things like the leading economic index has been contracting now for many, many months. Um, It's off 15.3% year over year. This is leading indicators of how the economy is doing. Um, These big big ticket items are, um, you know, just not being not being bought or being bought in much lower numbers. And we're seeing that in all sorts of the retail uh, conglomerates that are really active in that space. They're all reporting less spending, you know, uh, lower volumes, and um, a bunch of wealthy people going to the more discount stores. It's it's really quite something to watch unfold. Record insolvencies for developers in Canada. More than 200 real estate developments in Canada became insolvent last year. What's the picture now? Yeah, so this is the same kind of thing. Um, you know, again, during the easy money days, um, there was a, an oversupply of funding, particularly going to this so-called investor class of real estate, meaning condos primarily, um, where there was a bunch of people uh, flooding in there, not paying attention to whether prices were reasonable or whether there was negative carry and all that sort of thing. And now we've got, uh, that as uh, we've spoke of this before, Jim, how, you know, can Canadian mortgages lock in typically for terms of typically five years, four years, three years. And so it's not like higher rates instantly impact uh, financing costs, but they do now as mortgages come up for renewal every month, more and more people are realizing that, you know, they need to dump the properties that they have, either the, you know, additional homes, recreational homes and or rental properties that were negative carry have become, you know, burning through cash. Um, And so people are listing them. So we've got this big surge in um, inventory in places like Toronto in particular where there was a massive overbuild. Um, It's being described as a buyer's market without buyers and all sorts of uh, media outlets are finally covering this. But it's also, as I say, broad-based. It's not just in Canada or not just in Toronto and Vancouver. It's really... uh, contagious across most countries and um, in the U.S. for sure in major centers. The ones that saw the biggest price gains like Texas and Florida, California saw a big boom during the tech uh, frenzy in the past couple of years. So that's where a lot of, not as I say, it's not so much that mortgage rates are uh, historically high. They're about historically average today. The five-year fixed rate in Canada right now is about 4.2. It's come off from where it was, uh, you know, a few months ago when uh, rates were higher. And the U.S. 30-year is um, uh, about six and a half right now. So it too has come off significantly more than a percentage from its from its peak. And yet, um, you know, again, buying conditions. I mentioned buying conditions for autos are the lowest we've seen in decades. Buying conditions for housing is the lowest we've seen in decades, too. And then there's a whole bunch of people who are just 
falling behind, whether this is de- developers or households themselves, the bankruptcy rate for households and corporations is just skyrocketing. Um, so it's it's really something to watch. We've got, you know, um, more Canadian housing starts in process as well, which is going to continue to balloon inventory as we go forward here. Um, but the U.S. existing home sales were down 2.5% year over year in July. Supply was up nearly 20% year over year. Um, you know, the, the median existing sale price in July was 422000 in the U.S., and it was over 700 in Canada. So if you look at the math there, you know, the average long-term um, real estate appreciation over sort of a 20-year period has typically been about 4% a year. In Canada, we've seen almost double that. So there's still a lot of mean reversion here needs to happen because the affordability is not going to be helped by, you know, a couple of percent less in mortgage rates. You're going to need to see either mortgage rates come off, you know, 3 or 4%. Um, and or prices come off 25% or more. And I think it's going to be a combination of both of those things probably. So as I was mentioning before, you know, we're seeing the places like Lowe's, their sales expectations uh, in their latest release were off nearly 4%. Um, Home Depot just announced that their same-store sales were off nearly 4% year-over-year in the second quarter. That's the first revenue decline since the great financial crisis. So this gives you some sense. We've become so enamored of, you know, fixing up our shelter and making it fancier and, you know, people were um, doing gangbusters at the, you know, the uh, housing outfitter places. Um, But that's really um, changing at the margin significantly and those companies are reporting, you know, that they don't see that improving in the near future. I mean, for example, it's been seven quarters already where Home Depot has had, you know, negative uh, revenue, negative same store sales, and they're not guiding higher as they look out over the next 12 months. So it's, it's pretty amazing. And then you go back to what I said at the outset, which is that residential real estate is one of the three cyclical sectors that drives the bulk of discretionary spending, consumer spending, and jobs in the economy. Um, And so when it's in contraction the way that it is, that is quite a a major headwind in terms of economic growth. We'll have more with Danielle Park right after this. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Danielle Park. Danielle, the stock markets have been hitting continuous record highs. Does that mean eventually we're going to see a record correction? Yeah, usually that's the case. Uh, historically, that is what the the mean reversion process suggests. So like I said about housing, how in Canada it's, it's averaged about twice the historical norm over the past uh, 20 years, um, it suggests that you're going to get into a sideways period where that mean reversion works down, either flat prices that do nothing for an extended many years, or you get a big drawdown and it takes some time for prices to recover. So a similar thing is typical in the uh, stock market. Um, when you look at things like the case Schiller, or sorry, the CAPE, the Schiller PE ratio over 10 years inflation adjusted, we're at 35 times that average uh, earnings on the S&P 500 baskets as a whole. That's the third most expensive since 1871. It was only worse in the 2000 briefly. We're, we're worse than it was at the peak of the 29 bubble that burst and then spent 25 years trying to get back to the 29 prices. So um, it's... it's um, the, the, the historical record is pretty grim from valuations like this. And the same thing about forward-looking earnings. People will estimate that, you know, they think earnings growth of X and they look at where that is relative to price. And the current estimations um, were about 20, almost 23 times that in terms of forward price-to-earnings ratio. That's about twice the long-term norm. And it's not just the S&P. If you look at small-cap stocks or the NASDAQ, they're all both around 30 times projected earnings present. So there's no real value to be found. It's very rare that you can find anything that hasn't been infected by this uh, over 
zealous um, attitude um, in asset markets like the um, market vein a bullish sentiment is again about 77 percent today it was only worse really it's about as bad as it was at the tech bubble peak in 2000 so even though a lot of like for example the bank shares in canada are beloved bank shares that make up 30 percent of our tsx sector they're still flat actually down slightly in terms of price from where they peaked in february of 2022 and you've got the real estate reits are off about 22 percent from their peak um so there you know under the surface a lot of things have already been reflecting this uh uh slowing growth environment this you know uh falling sales uh the the crimp on on uh, profit margins if you look at Tarjay's earnings for example they beat expectations this week one of the bright sides in the consumer bright sparks in the consumer space but they did it by lowering their prices and trying to beat everyone to the bottom, so to speak. So they also guided down in terms of their profits going forward. So it's kind of a zero-sum game right now. Like Walmart is getting 60% of their revenue from groceries, and their report was, you know, uh, that they were only getting sales growth by take, attracting high-income uh, households who typically would have chopped other places and are now going to Walmart and getting primarily groceries and necessities. And meanwhile, though, you know, the low-income households are just falling off the the um, consumption wagon altogether. Um, it's it's also a function of the fact that personal savings rates have been drawn down. So again, during the pandemic, with the handouts, they were given uh, extra money, and so people have spent that over the past couple of years. Now the personal savings rate in the U.S. is back to just 3.4 percent. It's negative in terms of uh, lower income households who are just piling into debt to try and uh, make ends meet. Canadian personal savings rates about 6.9 percent. Um, again, it's reflective of it's typical for it to increase when the economy starts weakening and unemployment starts rising because people get really concerned about their employment and their ability to pay their bills. But the Canadian debt to income ratio is still above 180 percent, so it's the worst of the G7. Um, so all of that suggests that we've got, you know, it's kind of like this gambling fever, double or nothing um, mentality where people, you know, are, are having a hard time covering the bases and whatever money they have, they've put into gambling in really um, exuberant asset markets. Um, and the problem is there that what savings they have is likely to be hurt in this kind of environment. You know, we've had um, a bunch of um, rate cutting cycles in the last many decades and each time you get one you see that the you know the um the Fed basically reacts. So we're expecting that uh, Jerome Powell is going to give a speech tomorrow at uh, Jackson Hole, the central bank conference, and he's expected to intimate that, you know, they're ready to cut rates in September. That's been really confirmed this week by things like the BLS revision. So they, you know, this is, this is why these data points are so difficult for people to get their heads around because, you know, the, the jobs creation report has been bolstered in the past year and a half by what they call this BLS birth death model, which is an assumption about how many new jobs are being created by new companies. And so they, it turns out in the revisions that came out this week that that's been overstated by more than 800,000 jobs in the year ended March of 2024, and that the data looks like there's going to be more downward Visions to previously reported job growth for the next for April, May in this period. Again, it goes back to you know more than eighty thousand people have been laid off just in August alone in the U.S. and that's continuing in Canada as well. So um, every time the, these data points that people thought were evidence of economic strength and reasons that the Fed didn't have to start cutting rates, when these revisions hit, they're so big and so startling that all of a sudden they realize, oh man, we're behind the ball. And I think they are behind the, the eight ball here because they have bravely held rates, you know, as I said, at the highest real rates in more than 20 years and um, sort of waited to see what would happen. Well, uh, the, the consumer sector, the business sector, the insolvencies, all that spiking while the asset markets continue to whistle past the graveyard, that's really what's been happening. Um, but we've never seen an easing cycle in the past, 
you know, in the last 12 recessions since 1950, when the Fed cuts rates, it does so by more than 300 basis points, and the S&T falls while it does, an average of about 27%. And there's never been an easing cycle when the Fed funds rate doesn't end up below the five-year average, which today it's at 22 so that suggests that they're going to cut from their five and 5.45-ish area right now, that they'll cut the overnight rate back to about 2%. Um, currently, the, the bond market's got it about 3.5% as where they think the Fed's going to stop this cycle. So it looks to me like there's a great opportunity here in the government bond side. In other words, that the yields do not yet reflect how much rates are going to be cut this cycle in response to this incoming train wreck. Um, in Canada, we've also got the prospects of a big rail strike, um, you know, right now for CN and CP that could have a broad impact on all kinds of sectors because most of the goods in Canada is shipped uh, on the rail system, as you may know, um, and a whole bunch of our exports are dependent. So this is creating a whole bunch of dislocation and trouble at a time when we already had enough really to deal with. So I think we're going to get um, the central bar, the central bank is likely to start this, U.S. Fed likely to start cutting, following other major central banks who have already started cutting. Um, and we've got, you know, this extreme overshoot over valuation that has to be expunged out of financial assets like high-yield bonds are still too highly priced. The spreads between them and government bonds are like about 340 basis points right now. They're only paying about 3.4% more than government borrowers. And t- during recessions, you typically see prices of those high-yield assets fall, that, that that gap gets to more than 600 basis points, or about 6% is the amount they have to pay because they're, so, they're revealed to be so high risk in their borrowing. So I think that the corporate bond market is going to continue to reprice lower, which will make yields go higher. I think the government bond market will continue to price higher, which will mean yields are coming off and rates are coming off, but it'll take some time for that to filter through the, the um, overall economy. So, yes, I think bankruptcies are going to continue leaping here for a while. The, um, the Canadian banks are reporting um, they have not set aside enough in um, uh, in terms of their bad debt expectations or losses that are likely to come as this whole real estate mess unfolds. And it's not just the household sector, it's the private equity sector, it's the venture capital sector. You know, they've all been giving, they all took a bunch of free money and piled it into real estate, commercial and residential. So we've got this really vicious feedback loop as debt comes due in those sectors and they're too highly levered to borrow more and or they can't afford it at current rates. And then default and and then there's forced selling. So ultimately, that is a good thing for people waiting for prices to come back down to reality, but it is a painful process to watch for the economy. And as I've mentioned before, now that um, jobless claims are rising, that unemployment is much worse, uh, higher than had been previously reported, as we're seeing in the revisions, um, that unfortunately usually continues to get worse here as the central bank cuts rates. It's not like they start cutting and it solves everything. The unemployment rate usually spikes all the way through till they're done in the cutting cycle and even into the so-called economic recovery. So I think that's going to be really hard on highly levered uh, households. Danielle, thank you so much for being on the show. Hey, thank you, Jim. My guest has been Danielle Park, editor of the popular blog Juggling Dynamite and president of Venable Park Investment Council Incorporated. If you have any questions for Danielle or for any of our guests, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. Find us on X at How Street. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.